Thank you all so much for coming out. I know you all have busy lives, so thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Thanks for inviting me into the conversation. Uh, so what are we here to talk about? Uh, the name of the game tonight is Talk Saves Lives, an introduction to suicide prevention. Uh, but before we start the presentation, I figured I'd start out talking and talking about what I know the most and doing what I do best, and that's talking about myself, right? Uh, so I just wanted to introduce myself. Again, my name is Matt Crystal. Uh, I work uh, as a team leader for a team who works in the community with people with severe mental illness. I work as a support coordinator for people with developmental disabilities. I work as an outpatient therapist for children and families in crisis. I teach clinical mental health at Kane University, and in my free time, I do presentations for American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So I say all that, it sounds like I wear a lot of hats, right? And you probably saw my mullet growing in. I probably should wear a couple of hats, right? But I only wear one hat, but I do wear a lot of name tags. And the common thread throughout all those name tags is suicide prevention. Suicide is not rare to any community, and it's especially prevalent in communities that have mental health issues, which we're going to talk about here today. So as I go through the presentation, you might have some questions. I'm going to ask that you hold them to the end. They might get answered as we go along. If they don't, feel free to ask. <clears throat> if I don't have answers tonight, I'll make sure to get you answers after the presentation. So again, tonight's presentation, Talk Saves Lives, an Introduction to Suicide Prevention. So we just started. I already said the word suicide a few times, right? So we're going to say the word suicide a couple hundred times here tonight because we want to start and normalize talking about suicide and removing stigma around the word suicide. But suicide's a heavy word, right? Uh, it's something that we probably brought feelings from outside in with us here today, right? So it might sit heavy on our shoulders, in our hearts, in our chests, right? So I want you to think about the word suicide. Take a deep breath. Exhale and just try to blow some of that heaviness off of that word, all right? So this is the audience interaction part, you know, where I model breathing, and then you guys do it back, all right? So ready? Inhale. Exhale. You may have to do it one more time. You may have to do it a couple hundred more times, all right? But remember to breathe throughout the presentation. Uh, if certain feelings come up and you want to talk about them afterwards, I'll stick around uh, so we can have that conversation. But remember to breathe as we go. I'll check in with you as we go. But again, we want to say the word suicide because we want to get used to saying it, make it normal to talk about. All right? So let's jump right into our presentation. If we want to be brief, we can say TSL for Talk Saves Lives, right? Suicide is a complex health issue with no one single cause. But despite its complexity, suicide can be preventable. Just like there are warning signs and risk factors for other crises like cardiac arrest, we can learn the warning signs and risk factors that can help us to prevent people from dying by suicide. Just like with other health issues, time can be a critical and life-saving measure. And typically, a life can be saved if we allow time for that person's suicide risk to subside, allow time to connect them to help, allow time to let that period of stress uh, reduce, and allow time, again, to get them mental health help. To prevent suicide, we need to identify persons who may be suicidal and take an active role in connecting them to help before they take action to end their lives. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about some of the statistics around the problem of suicide to kind of give you the scope of the problem, right? We're going to go over some research findings. We're going to talk preventative factors. We're going to talk a little bit about what works and what we can personally do to help prevent this leading cause of death. So again, going forward, I talked about remembering to breathe and that suicide's a heavy topic, right? I want to move forward today with the shared understanding to give suicide and the topic the respect it deserves, but it's okay if there's moments where you're lighthearted or someone tells a story or someone smiles. You might have just had a loss and you're not ready to, to smile or have that conversation, but allow other people to do that, right? And move forward today with the shared understanding 
that, you know, we're all in this together, right? And we're going to give suicide the respect it deserves, but there are times, you know, we can smile, we can laugh, we can exchange stories, all right? And we might even um, be a little lighthearted here today, all right? So talking about talking, right? How we talk about suicide matters. How we talk about suicide going forward in today's presentation matters. But more importantly, how you talk about suicide after today's presentation matters. So we're going to go over a little bit of the language that we're going to use going forward. And this is a tough one because we're used to saying stuff, right? We're used to saying committed suicide, right? So what are we here to do? We're here to remove stigma. We're here to start normalizing talking about stigma, right? So when we hear the word committed, we start thinking about committed a crime, right? So we're adding a negative connotation onto the word. So going forward after today, let's just be direct. The person died by suicide. The person killed him or herself. The person ended his or her life. You might see some of those and you're like, wow, that sounds harsh, right? That's just being direct, right? That's what happened. If someone died by cancer, you would just say the person died by cancer, right? So again, we just want to be direct. We want to start removing negative connotations and be able to talk about it. So I'm not going to pop out from the woodwork behind you if you say committed suicide and wag my finger and say, hey, listen, I told you not to say that, right? No, but we're going to try to consciously move away from words that have negative connotations, right? So instead of saying committed suicide, ended his or her life. The other thing we want to avoid saying is failed or successful attempt, right? So again, negative connotations, somebody might think they're a burden, you know, and now you know, or they can't do anything right, and, you know, I had a failed attempt. So now we're adding extra pressure, a negative connotation. Let's just take that away, right? We also don't want to view suicide as something successful, right? That, you know, so let's move away from successful. Let's move away from failed. And again, just be direct. They made a suicide attempt. They died by suicide. Again, so it starts here today. Moving forward, we're going to try to change our language, to change the conversation to invite those conversations. So talking about some of the statistics that demonstrate the problem of the scope of suicide. And you're going to see me reference my book here from time to time, so please give me that, that freedom and leeway. There's some statistics and information, and I want to make sure I'm giving you guys the correct information. Uh, so suicide is a global problem. Worldwide, over 800,000 people die by suicide each year. And according to the World Health Organization, that's a conservative number because some countries do not report suicide accurately. Most staggering statistic for me is that that works out to a suicide every 40 seconds worldwide. So every 40 seconds in this world, somebody dies by suicide. In the United States, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death for Americans age 10 to 44. It's the second leading cause of death. Suicide takes more lives in the United States than homicide, war, and natural disasters combined. And if we want to break that down to a state level, suicide is the 14th leading cause of death for New Jerseyans and the second leading cause of death for New Jerseyans aged 15 to 24. For every death by suicide, it's estimated that another 25 others attempt suicide. That works out to about a million Americans a year who survive a suicide attempt. It's estimated that the majority of Americans will experience a suicide loss over the course of their lifetime. As I'm sure we're all too well aware, the loss of one can profoundly impact many, right? So AFSP, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, has resources from those grieving from suicide loss. Those can be found at AFSP.org slash surviving suicide loss, and I'll bring our resources up again at the end of the program. <clears throat> In addition to the devastating toll on families, both emotionally and socially, suicide has a fiscal impact too, right? The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, our buddies at the CDC, estimate, estimates that suicide costs the United States about $69 billion per year. That's primarily due to loss of productivity and lost wages. So that was some of the statistics. Moving on, we're going to cover some of the research. It's only been in the last few decades that scientists have begun studying suicide. Research is shedding light on some critical areas, and we still have more to learn. 
one of the big questions that I'm sure that we all ask ourselves and that researchers are exploring, why do people take their own lives? And there's no single one cause, right? Suicide most often occurs when stressors and health issues converge and it creates an experience of hopelessness and despair. Research has consistently shown us that 9 out of 10 people who have died by suicide had a mental health condition at the time of his or her death. It may not have been diagnosed, and if it was diagnosed, it might not have been adequately treated. But saying all this, mental health conditions cannot be the only thing that contribute to suicide. Mental health conditions cannot be the whole story, and why is that? It's because mental health conditions are common, right? One in four people will experience a mental health issue, and they all don't go on to die by suicide. So I say that to let you know that there's usually many other factors that increase risk as well. We've learned that the brains of people who have died by suicide differ from those who have died from other causes. They differ in terms of structure, they differ in terms of function, specifically in areas related to stress response and impulse control. Research has shown that people who try to kill them or kill themselves are ambivalent about death, right? And that's a key area, the ambivalence, right? There's part of them that wants to die, but there's also part of them that wants to live. And a key strategy in suicide prevention is engaging that part that wants to live and helping to create a distance away from that part that wants to die. So what have we learned about the perspective of a suicidal person? We've learned that a crisis point has been reached. We've learned that that pain seems so unbearable, whether it's emotional or physical pain, or sometimes both, right? Uh, and just to emphasize that for a moment, you know, think back to the most physically painful thing you've ever endured. Maybe it was childbirth, a broken bone, passing a kidney stone, or something else, right? So you're in that moment of intense physical pain, and I come along and I say, can I have clear and accurate directions to your house? you probably wouldn't be able to give them to me, right? And why is that? It's because unbearable pain makes ordinary thinking nearly impossible. And for a suicidal person, their thinking becomes limited to their moment of crisis, right? So, <clears throat> with that said, it's important to remember that suicidal feelings are often temporary. Again, there's evidence that by putting time and distance between an individual who is struggling and the means to ending their life, can be a life-saving action. That's why it's important that we take steps to recognize when somebody's struggling. Research has helped us determine some factors that can increase risk for suicide. When we talk about risk factors, we're talking about characteristics or conditions that increase a person's chance that they may take their lives. Again, just like someone who is at risk of heart disease may be have high blood pressure in their family or a history in themselves, right, or a history of heart disease, uh, they could be at higher, there's people who could be at higher risk for suicide than others. And these main risk factors can be grouped into the three categories we see before us. One, health factors, biological, psychological aspects of a person's health, historical factors, things that happen in a person's history or a person's family history. Or three, environmental factors, societal and cultural factors, having access to lethal means. And when I say lethal means, I mean having access to something that you could use to kill yourself. Um, the other thing when we talk about environmental factors, we usually talk about individual life events. <clears throat> so let me back up to our slide one more time, because we can see here, right, from these things colliding that just as they do on our slide here in real life, right? These risk factors can converge and collide in someone's real life and increase the risk for suicide during that particular point in time. So when we talk about health factors, we talk about medical conditions, right? The most significant of which being mental health conditions. Uh, Repetition is the mother of all learning here, right? So we said before, 9 out of 10 people who die by suicide had an active mental health condition at the time of their death. Depression is by far the most common mental health condition and one that is most commonly found as a risk factor to suicide. The best way to find out is for the person to seek effective treatment. 
seek evaluation, right? Oftentimes people don't even realize that their level of distress has become a health problem. So providing them with information like we're doing tonight or a crisis number or a text line that I'll give you at the end of the program can be a solid step in connecting that person to help. Other factors that can also increase risk, serious or chronic health conditions like diabetes, especially when the person also has a mental health condition. Serious or chronic pain can be factors, and a head injury can also increase suicide risk. So when we talk about historical factors, these can be past events in the person's history or the person's family history, a family history of suicide, a family history of mental health conditions or past trauma such as sexual abuse, PTSD, or combat stress. Talking about environmental factors, listed here, we see the most common, right? <coughs> so you see the word contagion, right? So when we talk about contagion, we're talking about graphic sensationalization of suicide, right? Like we might see in the news around somebody like Anthony Bourdain, Robin Williams, Chris Cornell, or, you know, a little further back, Kurt Cobain, right? When we keep hearing about somebody who had everything and you know, this was their way out, right? So we keep hearing about it, and that's how we get exposed to it. So with that said, I just want to take a step back from our presentation here, because when we talk about exposure, we're talking about contagion and keep hearing about that, right? But I want to make sure that we know that this is separate from talking about suicide, uh, because one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, can I plant the idea of suicide in someone's head just by asking about it? And a lot of times people will avoid talking about suicide because they're like, oh, this person's already in a bad way. I don't want to bring up suicide and then they're going to start thinking about it, right? So just want to clear that up that that is a myth, okay? If people are thinking about suicide, they're already thinking about suicide. They're not going to just start because you brought up the conversation. Um, so emphasize that point. Think about your most prized possession, you know, your watch, your piece of jewelry, your car, your PlayStation, your Xbox, I don't know, whatever it is. It's floating right here and right in front of your face. Can I have it? Can I have it? No, right? You're not just going to give it to me because I asked, because you're not that susceptible to suggestion. So just remember that going forward in the future, right? Humans are not that susceptible to suggestion, and you cannot plant the idea of suicide in someone's head just by asking about it. All right? And we'll talk a little bit later about how not asking the question, you know, uh, could be worse off than asking the question, right? So back to our slideshow here, right? Environmental factors, prolonged stress, stressful life events. Uh, stressful life events, divorce, legal problems, job losses, right? So one of the problems with the public perception of suicide is that we normally only hear about these environmental factors. We hear about a breakup, suicide, job loss, suicide, bullying, suicide, and we assume that suicide was a direct result of that one life event. Uh, it's usually not the case. It's usually not the full story, right? We don't know if the person had other risk factors, which they normally do. You know, were they suffering from depression? Were they drinking more than usual? Were they engaging in substance abuse uh, at the time? Were there other risk factors involved, right? So, again, environmental factors are usually not the full story. Looking to the future, research will help us find the best ways to fight suicide. Right now we're looking into biomarkers in the blood, uh, something in maybe a blood sample that might identify somebody at risk. There's already particular types of therapies that are effective for suicidal persons, and of course more need to be studied and more need to be developed. But research can help us identify the most effective interventions and medications. So. Let's talk a little bit about prevention. And before we do that, just want to check in. Again, I've said the word suicide maybe a million times here, right? So maybe it's time we take one of our breaths. Inhale. Exhale. And again, I don't know you guys, right? I don't know your level of comfortability or experience, right? So if this is stuff you've all heard before, great. Take something away, you know, as a refresher, right? If it's all new to you, I hope that... If you take nothing else, you feel more comfortable about using the word suicide after today, right? It's never going to be, 
you know, a not awkward conversation or a comfortable feeling, right? But the more we talk about it, the more we practice talking about it, it will be a little less awkward and a little bit more comfortable for us and the person we're talking to. So, back to our slideshow and prevention. When we talk about prevention, we're talking about protective factors, and that includes what we're doing here today about being proactive about our mental health, right? Having friends and family remind the person that they have somebody who cares about them. Using problem-solving skills, helping the person see that there's a light out of, out of the tunnel and that suicide doesn't have to be their only option or their only solution. Oftentimes the person might have cultural or religious beliefs that you can use to help them establish a sense of purpose. And again, Getting effective treatment for depression or anxiety can help prevent suicide. Mental health should be treated like any other aspects of our health, right? There's times that you feel physically sick, you have a stomach ache, right? You're going to go to the doctor, right? So if there's times when you're feeling that there's something going on there's, with your mental health, those are times you should seek treatment or encourage others to seek treatment. Because one of the biggest challenges we have in fighting suicide is getting people to treat their illness. Of those suffering from a mental health condition, less than half seek treatment. So again, we need to change the culture. We need a culture of what we're doing here today where everybody knows that it's smart to take care of your mental health. Mental health should be viewed just as important as taking care of our physical health. Again, mental health professionals and seeing a mental health professional should be seen, be seen as a sign of strength, right? A combination of psychotherapy and medication tends to be the most helpful for some people, but the important thing is find something that works for you or find something that works the best for that person, right? Mental health services are covered the same as physical health services. So I mentioned way back at the beginning of our presentation, right, that I teach mental health classes at Kane University. I just actually came from one right before this, right? And the homework I gave them today is the same homework I give every class every week, and that's to practice self-care, right? And it may sound like one of those things, oh, that must be one of those classes where you just talk about your feelings. It is, right? It's a mental health class where we're helping to process our own feelings about working with others, right? But the reason... I bring up self-care and make that a homework assignment is because what goes on in regular life, right? Somebody says, I need you to do this. You need to do this. Here's the due date for this. You know, this is coming up, right? Everything is what you have to do, right? But I want to give you a homework assignment, and that's to remember to do something for you. Take a moment for yourself. Practice self-care. And, you know, nowadays self-care sounds almost like a cliche thing. You know, you see this exercise more have a healthier diet, sleep more, manage your stress. Sounds simple, right? But we know it isn't. But we do know when we don't do these things how it can negatively impact our mental health, right? So if we did do more of them, we could positively impact our mental health. And again, we want to prevent burnout so we can help more people in the future and help ourselves, right? So self-care doesn't have to be a two-week yoga retreat, you know, that would be nice, but you know, self-care could be something for you, right? Stepping outside, having your coffee, going for a walk, listening to your favorite song, taking a few deep breaths, reading a book, talking to other people about what they do for self-care, right? Or maybe self-care is taking something off your plate, right? Having to set boundaries or say no to something, all right? So just remember that, your homework assignment after today, practice self-care, uh, do it for you and do it for others. All right. That was my preachy part of the lecture. So, back to our slideshow here. We need to also provide support for those touched by suicide. And as we talked about before, the loss of one person obviously can impact many, right? And it's important that survivors get the help they need, not only to heal, but to help reduce their own risk of suicide. And again, the most important thing you can put between a suicidal person and the way of ending their life is time. Research has shown us that by temporarily reducing a suicidal person's access to lethal means can equal a life saved, right? And give us time to connect that person to help. Temporarily reducing access to lethal means can equal a life saved. 
All right, so when we talk about prevention, right, and protective factors, some high-level prevention strategies have included carbon monoxide sensors in cars, barriers on bridges have proven to be a deterrent, and making suicide prevention part of gun safety courses. And I'm not here to have a Second Amendment debate with you. I'm just here to say if guns are a known lethal means, then why don't we have suicide prevention education at gun ranges? Or if you're purchasing a firearm, to have literature uh, to educate people about suicide prevention, right? So what are we doing here? We're looking for opportunities. Opportunities to buy us more time. Opportunities to connect the person at risk to someone that can help them. All right? So when we talk about someone that can help them, right? And we'll talk about this later. This doesn't mean you have to solve the person's problems in the moment, right? It just means you have to try to connect them to help, right? When we talk about suicide, right, and someone offering up, you know, their suicidal feelings or their suicidal ideation, we call those invitations. And we call them invitations because they're looking for an RSVP, right? And the RSVP, when it comes to suicide, should be, yes, you can talk to me about suicide, right? And we'll talk about how we do that. Um, but before we do, I just want to say that Everything we talk about today is about going forward, right? We can't change the past, right? So when we talked about invitations just now, maybe you lost someone to suicide, and maybe they didn't offer up any of these invitations to you, right? So you wouldn't have known. Nothing we talk about today is a blaming statement of, you know, what you should have done or what you should have looked for, all right? This is going forward, all right? So going forward, we said that we want to feel slightly more comfortable talking about suicide, but we also want to think suicide first, right? So we can rule out whether suicide is involved or not. All right, so feel slightly more comfortable around suicide and start thinking suicide first after today. So it's important that we have a conversation with the person to allow them to share what they're experiencing. This not only shows you care, but it will help you gain information about the person's level of distress. You want to watch for warning signs. You want to watch for warning signs in yourself. You want to watch for warning signs in others. All right, again, so we're thinking suicide first after today. Right, we want to reach out to individuals in our life if we're concerned about them. And we want to reach out if we're struggling. All right, we want to encourage people to seek mental health services if they're depressed. Right, and we want to do the same for ourselves. What do we look for? Well, suicide warning signs can typically be displayed in three main ways. Talk, behavior, and mood. All right, so people who talk about suicide may say something outright. They may talk about ending their lives. You know, they might make a joke about it. Either way, take it serious, right? You may hear someone say, oh, that person just wants attention. Okay, then let's give them the attention, right? If someone is using suicide as a way to get your attention, then I think we need to have a conversation with them about what's going on, right? So the person may also say they have no reason to live. You may hear something like, I'm a burden to others, uh, that they feel trapped, or they have a feeling of being overwhelmed or in an unbearable pain. So just a few things to listen for. What can we look for in terms of behavior, right? Well, maybe increased use of drugs, increased use of alcohol, Difficulty sleeping, sleeping more, dual meaning of the word careless, right? They are acting careless, they're acting recklessly, you know, engaging in drugs more, right? Or maybe they are literally caring less, right? They're isolating from friends and family, they're withdrawing from activities that they once loved, right? So some things they want to look, you want to look for. Uh, you also want to see if they're looking for ways to kill themselves, right? Maybe they have online browser history of, uh, you know, looking for firearms or looking up different combinations of pills. Or another one to watch for is someone giving away all of their possessions, right? So, a few things to look for. What are some things that we might feel, right? Uh, well, suicide, uh, people at risk for suicide can display some of the following moods, right? Depression, apathy, impulsivity, irritability. You know, and you might see this list and you're like, Matt, I had all of these on the commute over here today. You know, I had all of these just trying to find where the municipal court was, right? And sure, we all have our ups and downs, right? But the key thing here is if someone is acting uncharacteristically for how they normally act, right? So if someone is acting more anxious than usual or more irritable than usual, 
you know, there's a sign that we want to reach out, right? And that was a whole lot of things to look for. It was just three slides, but there's probably a whole much, a uh, whole bunch more things we can add to that, right? So, moving forward, trust your instincts, trust your gut. Um, assume you're the only person that's going to reach out. Again, think suicide first after today. Use a rule of thumb, right? If you're wondering if someone's depressed, if you're wondering if they're acting overly anxious, there's your sign. Reach out to them. Hey, I noticed you're acting overly anxious. I know notice you kind of seem more depressed. You know, what's going on? Um, and the same thing goes for you. If you're having suicidal thoughts, those are the times you want to reach out for help, right? If you've reached out before, reached out, reach out again. Right, and these go two ways. Uh, you know, if you've reached out before and you need help again, reach out again. Right, if you've reached out to someone before and you see they're struggling, reach out to that person again. All right. <clears throat> so, at this point in the presentation, right, you might think to yourself, you know, how do I do this? You know, how do I talk to somebody? All right. Well, talk to that person in private. Right. Listen to their story. You want to express concern. You want to express your caring. You don't want to promise them secrecy, right? Because you want to be able to share this information to get them help, right? So you can promise them your commitment to help or your concern, right? Um, but the other main thing I want to bring up, right? So I brought up a couple key points. Please feel more comfortable about suicide after today. Think suicide first. But the most important one is after today, if you're concerned, about somebody in suicidal ideation, ask them directly about suicide using the phrase, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? All right? I know you're thinking, wow, that's harsh, or that's hard to say, right? Practice it in your head. Practice it on your drive home if you're concerned about it. Practice it in the mirror. Are you thinking about suicide? Because if you think that sounds harsh to somebody, right, and you say, are you thinking about hurting yourself or are you thinking about harming yourself? Maybe they don't see suicide as a way of harming themselves. They don't see suicide as a way of hurting themselves, right? So you walk away having two totally different conversations. So how do we rule out for having the same conversation? Are you thinking about suicide? It also shows the person, hey, they can talk to you about suicide. Again, you're going to panic on the inside, but on the outside, let them know they can talk to you, right? So if you don't say the word suicide, or are you thinking of killing yourself, right? This person might say, all right, this person is obviously not comfortable having this conversation, so I'm not going to have the conversation, right? Or I already feel like I'm a burden to this person. I don't want to put anything else on them. So again, going forward, are you thinking about suicide? A lot of people say, oh, somebody might get mad at me. All right. I'd rather have the person mad and alive than not ask the question and walk away and find out that they went through with suicide. <clears throat> All right, so again, ask directly. Uh, and encourage them to seek mental health services, right? And again, we're going to share a tip line, a uh, crisis line at the end. You know, maybe you have some that you Googled, or maybe you can involve the person in the process, right? Who have they called for help in the past? Uh, who can be called this time, right? Some things that you want to avoid, right? You want to avoid minimizing the person's feelings, right? Maybe you've never experienced a major depressive episode and you literally can't imagine what that person's going through. All right, so let's avoid minimizing how they feel. Uh, we want to avoid trying to convince them that life is worth living. We just talked about before, right, that a suicidal person is not thinking clearly, right? So philosophical debates about life being worth living or not usually tend not to be too helpful in that moment. And a big one, right, because we hear about suicide and we immediately want to help fix the problems and move on, right? We want to save the person in the moment, right? We want to avoid advice giving, all right? So if I fell down right now and I'm having a heart attack, you know, would you yell out, Matt, you should have eaten better in 44 years. Matt, you should have got more exercise in 44 years. I hope not. I hope you would try to connect me to help, right? I hope you'd call 911. I hope you'd call somebody that can come in here and help me, right? So again, we want to avoid advice giving. The person, again, we want to connect the person to help, all right? And overall, we just want to listen and offer to connect them to help. Again, we don't have to be the ones to save all our problem, their problems, right? We just want to be able to offer to connect them to help. We talked about invitations, right? They're offering it up to us. 
the only control we have in this situation is whether to get involved or not, right? So, I would assume and hope, you know, that we RSVP, yes, we will make that choice to get involved. What if you think a person might make an attempt soon, right? Well, stay with them if you can. Don't leave them alone. Uh, if they have lethal, lethal means in the home, pills, help them flush them, right? If they have a gun in the home, step outside with them. All right, if you can go with them to emergency services or take them to the emergency room, great. Uh, an overriding rule, keep yourself safe, right? You can't help somebody in the future if you're not here to do it. So if they have a gun in the home and they're not willing to step outside with you, you step outside. You call the police, all right? Again, involving them in the process or helping them uh, through the process by offering them a resource to help, right? Um, the crisis... Lifeline, Suicide Prevention Lifeline, call 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-8255. You don't feel comfortable talking, they don't feel comfortable talking, send a text. Text the word TALK to 741-741. In either one of these situations, a trained counselor will be on the other end that can help you and the person connect to resources or what to do next. All right. Uh, starting in July, I think it's July 16th, um, there will also be 988, which you can call to be connected to a trained counselor. A lot of people have called it the 911 of suicide prevention, but it is different, right? You call 911, someone connects you to the police, and the police come to your home, right? You call 988, you get connected to a counselor that will try to walk you through, again, what to do next, all right? So I encourage you all, take a screenshot. Um, save this number on your phone. On the way out, there is little Lifesaver wallet cards. They look like little cards that would fit in your wallet. Uh, they have these numbers inside. So take a few, take as many as you want. Keep them on you. You may need them for yourself and you can hand them to somebody. Hey, can you help call this number with me? Or you may need them for somebody else and you say, hey, I have these numbers. Let's try calling them together. Uh, again, you may run into a situation. I don't know what to do here. Okay, you don't have to, right? Let's call somebody who does. Let's call this uh, crisis text line and see how they can help us. All right, so I encourage you again, either take a picture of this or grab them on the way out, and I'll bring it up again at the end of the program. Of course, if there's an emergency in progress, you're going to want to call 911. Together, we can create a culture, again, that's smart about mental health. We can help save lives, and hopefully we can help improve lives. The name of the presentation today was Talk Saves Lives. It sounds like a simple idea, right? But, it's, but it works, right? Talk can save lives. Even if you're wrong about the suicide risk, a person may be in distress, right? They could feel comforted knowing that somebody's open to having this conversation, knowing that somebody cares about them, or somebody took the time to listen. Or this could be the encouragement they need to seek mental health help. So before I open it up to the question and answer part, I just want to emphasize the point of Talk Saves Lives by paraphrasing the story of Kevin Hines. You might have heard of him before, and again, I'm paraphrasing his story here, but Kevin Hines, man who lived in San Francisco, and he decided that he was going to go through with suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. I uh, thought that nobody cared about him, and that that was his way out, right? So the morning that he's going to go through with his plan, he says to himself, if one person stops me on my way to jump off this bridge, I'll know that one person out there cares about me, and I don't have to go through with this. So he walks to the bus stop, crying, crying, crying. Nobody says anything to him. He rides the bus to the Golden Gate Bridge, still crying. Nobody says anything to him. Gets off the bus, starts walking to the bridge. Someone taps him on the shoulder. He feels relief. I don't have to go through with this. Turns around. The person hands him a camera and says, can you take my picture? So while he's crying, he takes their picture, walks over, jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge, and he instantly regrets his decision, right? And he miraculously goes on to survive, uh, and he becomes a suicide prevention educator and speaker about mental health issues and mental health awareness. So why do I tell that story at the end of all my Talk Saves Lives? Because it emphasizes the point, right? Talk can save lives. Had one person said, hi, how are you? We could have changed the narrative to one of hopelessness to one of hope, right? Uh, and you may be thinking, you know, I don't know Kevin Hines. I don't know what's characteristic for him or, uh, you know, normal for him or not, right? Let's assume somebody crying on the bus is uncharacteristic for them, right? Does it hurt, again, to reach out 
to be a good person, to say, hi, how are you? Hey, I see you're crying. Is everything all right? Uh, so again, talk can save lives. Is it always going to be that easy? No, probably not. But the point is, it can be, right? Had one person just talked to him, just reached out, right, we could have changed that narrative. So in the future, when you're thinking, I'm not going to get involved, or maybe I shouldn't, or, you know, just think about Kevin Hines, right, how having a conversation can make a difference. So if you're so inclined, you can go to AFSP.org, give your feedback on the presentation. Um, you can also follow AFSP.org on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I'll save you the infomercial on AFSP. But I will let you know that American Foundation for Suicide Prevention does have a New Jersey chapter. Uh, you can find them on Facebook or uh, any social media at AFSP New Jersey spelled out. Uh, you can link to volunteer events, you can find more trainings, more conversations, or you can be directed to resources. Uh, so I'm going to bring it back to our slide with our prevention um, crisis numbers, just so you have them. I want to thank you all for listening, and I encourage you to take that deep breath. Uh, but if you have any questions for me, you know, I'm happy to try to answer them, or if you have something you want to talk about afterwards, you know, I'll be happy to, to talk to you afterwards. Uh, one thing I will uh, end with is that, you know, again, there's never going to be a time when it's comfortable to have this conversation. But if you need an icebreaker, I just came from Talk Saves Lives and some of the stuff they talked about, you know, I'm seeing in you, are you thinking about suicide? I just came from a suicide prevention workshop and a lot of the stuff they said stuck out to me about what's going on with you. and You know, are you thinking about suicide, right? You can use that 10 minutes from now, 10 weeks from now, 10 years from now, right? That, you know, you had a suicide prevention workshop and, you know, some of the stuff is really sticking out, and, you know, you wanted to ask the person again. So that could be, you know, your way in uh, to having that conversation. All right, I'll take a minute from my ramblings here uh, to do my own breath. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. If you have any questions or feedback or concerns that I can try to address, I'm all ears. If you don't, that's cool too. <laughs> I had a question when you mentioned on one of the slides that uh, insurance companies have to pay for mental health settings and physical. Is that relevant to you? Because when I retired in 2016, and the company I was at, at United Healthcare, they would cover mental health visits up to eight visits a year at 50%, which I thought was incredibly unfair. Sure, so I can't speak specifically to each insurance company, but I do know, yeah, most insurance companies do cover, you know, at least a few sessions. Most employers have, like, an employee assistance program where they'll let you do, like, three free sessions and then connect you to a resource that works with your, either your insurance or, you know, if you don't have insurance, that might work with, uh, you know, a payment program. But, yeah, um, most companies have adopted something that, you know, that allows you to have at least a few sessions um, and then figure out a plan from there. But well, yeah, great question is one of the things about finding resources, right? Because, you know, when we talk about suicide, you know, we want somebody who's available and approachable, but who's there at the moment, right? We didn't, you know, it's great if you have a therapist and you're going to make an appointment in two months from now for a follow-up, but what are we doing in that moment, right? And that might be bringing in, you know, adult protective screeners or the emergency room. Yeah, I raised that up. I'll retire now, so I'm on Medicare. And a lot of psychologists and counselors and psychiatrists will not accept Sure. Um, I think I got to look up the make sure I'm giving you the right information. But I think it's called Headspace.com or Headspace.org uh, can help uh, find your resources that work, uh, you know, with whatever insurance or lack of insurance in your area. But yeah, great question, great topic. What else? Sure. I'm a counselor at a school nearby. Um, I actually teach life science, which is a student that I've mentioned before, so I'm sure you know that. Um, is there anything that we can point that we can continue doing at school um, you know, to help support our target? Sure. Uh, great, great question. And I, I think, you know, being proactive. 
uh, because most times we're invited to the school after there was a tragedy, right? But every time we try to approach the schools, now I'm saying every school, but most of them, uh, hey, we'd like to do this. Oh, no, we're, we're not, we're not going to have that conversation, right? Or I don't know if we should open that up. And, you know, we're not usually invited in unless we're talking about, we're here to talk about mental health and suicide. Right, but if it was you know just normalized, hey, we're here to talk about suicide prevention so we can help reduce suicide in schools. Okay, great, but that's one of the main things is getting in there uh, and just having that conversation because you know you, a lot of people say, oh, the teens aren't thinking about their you know every at any age you could be thinking about it, you know. So just inviting that conversation and letting people know it's okay to talk about this stuff uh, where it seems. You know, we're, it's 2022 and we're still running into obstacles of people not wanting to talk about it. And again, you know, I know it's a tough conversation, you know, but if, it would be a lot easier if people were willing to, to have that conversation or to invite people to, in to talk about having it. So I think that would be the first step, just schools kind of opening it up, you know, and being proactive about it. Also, I think just educating people, too, on what the resources, is, even if it's, you know, leaving literature out with here's the crisis line, you know, in the office or the, you know, I don't, they're not called guidance counselors, right, school counselors, whatever it's called, but outside of the office, right, you know, here's some information about, you know, crisis text lines, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, so they have the resources out there because a lot of people don't know where to go with any of this stuff. I have these thoughts, I have these feelings, what do I do with it, I'll just keep it to myself until I can't handle it anymore, you know, but if they had some kind of solid resource, you know, because maybe they're not comfortable talking to that school counselor, and that was their only person that they thought they were going to talk to, you know, or that's available, but now, you know, they have resources here, or they can be directed to somebody. One thing I'll tell you is that in our school, we do have the fact, we have those, it's, well, we have one of those things, one of those resources on the back of every student's ID card. Oh, wow, that's amazing. That's cool, that's something I should... That's yeah, that's incredible. I, that's something that hope, you know should be adopted everywhere, right? Just so again you have the resource. That's really cool. And like you said, forward thinking, right? Where it's you know trying to be preventative. So awesome. Cool. Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Sure, I don't have any like direct statistics on that at the moment, but you know, I know that you know, uh, in the veteran population, it is a major problem. Numbers have been on the rise. Um, so again, just trying to you know be in the conversation there, whether it's with you know uh, facilities for veterans and veteran affairs. You know, I think you know just just promoting the resources and you know having the conversation. You know, uh, you know, I've done for for police departments and a couple places like that, but I think doing them for, you know, veterans associations, you know, just again, tr trying to invite people to have the conversations. I did it uh, at the Freemasons. I'm trying to think of what town it was, but there was a lot of veterans there. And just, you know, hearing them talk and open up, it was really cool to, you know, just that they, I feel like it was the first time they had a forum to, you know, okay, it's okay to talk about this here. So, you know, kind of just inviting that conversation. But yeah, it's definitely a, a population that could, uh, could benefit from having more resources. Cool. All right, everybody. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, again, I don't have any specific statistics, you know, but, uh, you know, I would think it varies from, you know, handguns or, you know, overdosing, you know, but I, I don't want to say specifically because I don't have the statistics in front of me, but, you know, again, just the fact that it's so prevalent, again, same thing with veterans, right, how do we have, or the question about being in the schools, right, how do we, you know, start talking about preventative factors and educating people on it, right, and just having that conversation is important. You have a great question, you know, and again, this is, you know, stuff that uh, I can get back to you with, uh, if you guys want to provide me with your emails or whatever it is, or send it to, um, I'm sorry, Kurt was his name, who was the organizer? So if we want to send it to Kurt too, I can, he can always send me additional questions and I can get the answers back to him.
right, cool. So again, a lot of times we we have these these meetings, right? And you leave, and you're like, oh, I just came from a, you know a suicide prevention workshop, and someone's like, oh, that must have been a drag, right? And it, and it's like, no. The positive reframe here is that you know we're trying to educate ourselves and others, right, on ways that we can help or reduce suicide, and that's a positive thing, right? And if we start talking positively about not even this presentation, but having that conversation, right? And we open it up to someone else to, to going to, to find out more about suicide prevention, right? So there is a positive reframe that, you know, this is a good thing that we're doing. Again, trying to create a community and a culture, you know, where taking care of our mental health is seen as a sign of strength, right? Or as a smart move. So I uh, just want to offer up that, you know, that positive reframe as we leave here today. But cool. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, if you guys want to do any more, oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, if you ever want to do them in the future, let me know. Um, you know, even if it's one person, I've done them in the libraries before, where it was one person, and the other person was, oh, I apologize, there's only one person. I'm like that one person wanted to come here to hear this, and I'm glad I was here to talk to them about it. So, you know, if you want to do any in the future, just let me know. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.